Hi. Oh, there we go. I'm on. Um, thank you so much for coming. Uh, so I haven't given a talk on this project at all yet, and so this is all very fresh, and so I apologize in advance um, if things are not as smooth as they ideally would be. Um, just to get like a feel for the room, could I get a show of hands if you've like foraged for plants or mushrooms before? Okay, cool, amazing. So I'm hoping that this is going to be interesting from like a research perspective, and I've put some um, some sort of interesting little plants that are more unusual at the end as well. Um, I grew up in the countryside. I grew up in rural Sussex, um, and so foraging for things was just part of my childhood. Um, whether that was like going mushroom picking with my mum for field mushrooms or you know, blackberries, whatever it is, it's, it's just an inherent part of, of growing up in the countryside. Uh, and this project started because uh, I'd been in the east end of London for about eight years and I'd gone back home to, to visit my family. And I realised my relationship with my environment was completely different when I was in the countryside compared to um, in town. So it, just a different way of like, you're, you're constantly looking at the ground, you're looking in the undergrowth, you're seeing what, what you can see, you know, if there's anything interesting, if there's anything poisonous, if there's anything that's, you know, just coming into season, something to keep an eye out for, you know, or the blackberries aren't quite ripe yet, but, you know, if we wait too long, the birds are going to get them. Um, and so, sort of this, noticing this behavior in myself, I, I remembered hearing about um, different foods that, that had sort of fallen out of favor. Uh, just with, with changes in the plants that we're eating, changes in uh, sort of uh, globalization and with things like potatoes and tomatoes coming in with uh, colonialism and, and uh, sort of, you know, venturing to uh, North America, South America. Um, and sort of pig nuts was the one that, that I'd always heard of, this sort of funny, funny sort of root vegetable, um, which potatoes sort of usurped. Um, pig nuts are sort of tricky to find. You only get one per... Per, uh, per flower, um, and I sort of, I thought, what, 500 years ago, what were people eating? 500 years ago in this environment, like, what would the foodstuffs have been? Because actually a lot of things that are in our hedgerows, they're naturalized, they aren't, they aren't native, they're, you know, things that have escaped from farming, things that have escaped from uh, fields and so on. Um, and so I went looking for that information, and, and I couldn't find it. <laughs> um, and I thought that that was going to be something that I could just Google, and it would be apparent, and, and it wasn't. Uh, and so that started the next three years of research. <laughs> um, and so that's what I'm here to share with you today. Um, so what's exciting about this is that I found uh, uh, 1,350 edible native plants and 344 edible mushrooms. Uh, and in a minute, I'm going to go in depth on how I did that. Um, but here's how those things went together. This is very loosely categorized. This, Really, this is, <laughs> this is research that's coming in a very raw form. I have a giant Excel spreadsheet, and I've had to turn that into a talk. So uh, loosely categorized, I went for fruit and berries, which is just over 100 things, roots, root vegetables, uh, things that you, you know, you'd think of like parsnip and, and potato, but um, weirder. Um, so roots, herb seasoning and additives. This was a tricky one because there's a lot of things that are used as like thickeners for soups. Um, they're used as seasonings. Um, things, there's sort of odd things in here as well, things that are used to, to process other foods. Um, and so I sort of lumped that into one category and it's really clumsy and that needs fixing. But for now, herb seasoning and additives. Uh, drinks and teas, that covers a multitude of sins from um, herbal tea right the way through to narcotic wine. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go too deep on that one, but it, it does exist. Uh, edible flowers, I couldn't fit them in anywhere else. Um, they're decorative mostly, and so and they're nice, and they're flavorsome. They can be added to drinks, they can be added to cakes. Uh, beans and legumes, um, does what it says on the tin. Uh, grains, nuts, and seeds, again, so this is more like uh, dried things, processed things, uh, things that would be turned into breads, into gruels. Um, there's an alarming number of seeds that are just gruel. Um, and so that was a fun thing to learn about what our diet would have been a few hundred years ago. Uh, vegetables and salad was by far the highest. Um, this is, the vast majority of this is like salad leaves. Um, I wish that it was more inspiring than it was. There are some interesting things in there, but um, the vast majority of just salad. And then uh, edible mushrooms. Um, I'm not going to go too deep on mushrooms. Um, actually, no, hang on, I'll say that in a sec. Um, <laughs> The thing that I wanted to say, 
ahead of this is that um, I want to prime this talk with the context, and to me this is, this is actually like the crux of the whole thing, is that globally the average human diet contains less than 50 plants. Um, 20 plants account for 90% of the global diet. If you include uncontacted tribes in our count, that number goes up to still less than 100. Um, and so the fact that there are about 1,300 things uh, growing natively in this country that could be used for food, granted, even if we rule out half of them and say half of them are like famine foods that you have to process beyond belief, um, it's still shockingly higher than the average diet for most of the planet. Um, I did say I'm not really going to talk about mushrooms. Uh, the reason for that is that like, mycology is a wildly changeable field um, and there's ever-evolving classifications. I'm not a specialist in mushrooms. Um, I relied really, really heavily on Roger Phillips' Mushrooms Guide for that part of this project. Uh, that's the most reliable text that I know uh, other than keeping on top of the constantly updating journals and classifications and so I ran with that. Um, it's wonderfully in-depth. Uh, it has an alarmingly visceral taste and texture description for almost every mushroom, including the most poisonous and least edible. Um, this man really went through some things putting this book together. And so <laughs> if you would like a really comprehensive mushroom guide, it has wonderful kind of like full-size full pictures and everything, that's my wholehearted recommendation. And do check the tasting notes, even for things that aren't edible. Um, <laughs> so... Speaking of 50 plants, um, if you just sort of like start to think about the things that are in your diet, hops, wheat, peas, carrots, black pepper, um, one of the tricks is many of our vegetables are actually just one plant. Um, and this is something that uh, I think some people, some people know and, and are wildly enthusiastic about, some people are horrified to, to learn, and so I thought I'd just throw it in here. Um, Brassica oleracea, um, I hope that I've pronounced my Latin correctly, uh, is wild mustard. And it's actually also most of our most popular vegetables. Um, this is just a bonus fact. Really, there are more vegetables than this, um, which are the same plant as well, but these are the most popular. And so you can see that we took just one plant and we just selective for all the possible properties that we could get from it. So Brussels sprouts, lateral leaf buds, cabbage, terminal leaf buds, kale as leaves, uh, kohlrabi as the stem, cauliflower for the flower buds, broccoli for the flower bud heads. Um, yeah, so... If you start counting up your vegetables, if any of them are this, I'm afraid it just counts for one. So where do you start? Um, I, <laughs> um, sorry, I've just lost my place in my notes. Um, okay, yeah, so where do you begin working out what we used to be eating here? So, like I said, I originally thought that this would exist somewhere, but all I got was just a load of woefully incomplete foraging guides, uh, which didn't really differentiate between things that were actually native and things that you would um, think things that were just naturalized things that had come from fields and so on. Um, so trying to build up from scratch and find all of the edible things using other people's information that way uh, really didn't work. And after about a day, I realized that this wasn't the right approach. Um, so I came in it from the other direction, and I started with the BSBI database of all native and naturalized plants, which is nearly 1,900 plants. Uh, the BSBI is the Botanical so uh, Society of Britain and Ireland, who have an incredibly comprehensive survey of all plants across the UK, including a map pinpointing incredibly specific exact distributions for every plant. Um, I wasn't looking at the distribution for this. Uh, I was looking at the checklist of all UK vascular plants with native status. Um, so this is just one little snippet of that. Uh, there's pages and pages and pages and pages of this, um, and it's incredibly comprehensive. Um, so there's an entry for um, Aramaculatum, uh, Lords and Ladies, um, or Cuckoo Pint by its common name. Um, if you're not familiar with the names, there's some images, you will see them around. Um, they're, they're pretty common. Um, so you've got sort of, at the very top, this is probably my favorite thing about this database, is that uh, they include all of the vernacular names that are available in all of the UK languages, which is just a really, really nice touch for um, a database that spans the whole of the UK. Um, so you've got that at the top there, and then you sort of work your way down through uh, the different bits and pieces. And the thing that I'm really excited about in this project is right the way at the bottom, the very last line, which you may not actually be able to see on this projector, where it says, national status, native. So I went through this whole database and I copied it over into Excel 
um, because I'm not skilled with computers. Um, and so just the, just the bits I needed like out of each of those entries. Um, and so then I have my list of native and naturalized plants. So that's 1,900 plants, not mushrooms, um, with entries that sort of look like this. So I spent the next two years of my life looking at this spreadsheet <laughs> uh, because I individually researched every single one. Uh, I have hundreds of PDFs of books and research papers that I trawled through one by one to identify or eliminate or deduce edible foods for this list. Uh, some of these were straightforward, some of them were just recipes, most were obscure documentation like archaeological digs which found traces of specific seeds that had been used in cooking by someone at one point in time, uh, ethnographic studies interviewing rural communities around the world about their cooking, uh, studies counting wild plants that were being foraged and sold in markets. Uh, there was such an incredibly broad range of information. Um, this was a really interesting process, it was exhausting and it took quite literally years, uh, but it was really interesting. Uh, a lot of the research was not in English, and so I got really good at scanning through Latin origin languages for sentences that looked sort of useful to Google Translate. Um, although papers in languages like Turkish and Chinese, I eventually had to just translate in blocks and skim read through the dodgy Google translations. This whole process, as well, it's important to say, doesn't account for things that have gone extinct. So. Um, there's an enormous list of uh, plants that have since gone extinct. I'm not going to go through that list to try and find edible things in it. Uh, it's something like, it's in the hundreds of thousands. Um, having done 1900 and it taken two years, I don't think I could survive it. So um, here is just a, a, a little glimpse of like, this is what my, my desktop looked like for four years. So there's a number of questions and challenges that came up aside from just the, the boring legwork of doing the research. I say boring, it was fascinating, but you have to say things like boring when you're talking about spending three years looking at uh, just research papers about plants. Um, <laughs> the biggest question that this process brought up and the biggest change to my thinking was the blurring of line, uh, blur, sorry, blur, blurring lines of food, medicine, and poison. Um, those are things that you think would be very distinct and they're things that um, in our current way of thinking are very distinct. Um, I went in right off the bat, like, I'm interested in food. I want to know about food. What were people eating? I know the medicinal stuff, like, that's not relevant. It's not about medicine. I want to know about foods. Um, and I very quickly discovered that that approach just wasn't going to work and that mindset wasn't going to work. And this is the biggest takeaway that I've had from this project. And so um, that's why I've kind of really led with this. Uh, this was the biggest realization. Um, and I think the aha moment was reading that the ancient Greeks didn't differentiate between medicine and food. So um, Pliny the Elder's natural history lists all of the useful plants with no differentiation between things that could make you throw up compared to things that were delicious vegetables. Um, because it's all things that you ingest, it's all things that affect your body in one way or the other. So my favorite example of this is willow. Um, so Willow, up until very, very recently, was the preferred painkiller of choice. Um, all parts of willow are useful as a painkiller, uh, whether that is uh, the inside of the bark, whether it's the catkins, the roots, the leaves, all parts of it. You can soak in a bath with it, uh, you can eat it, you can rub it on your skin. There's so many options. And so aspirin is actually a synthetic copy of the salicin that exists in, um, in willow that they uh, basically spent 10 years attempting to copy as good as willow already was. So willow is edible. You can eat it, you can ingest all parts of it, and it's a painkiller. It's got that aspirin-y taste to it, though. So how much of that do you really want to put in your food? It's good for you. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's a natural herb. But you probably don't want to be eating that on a regular basis. Maybe you do. Aspirin is also recommended as a daily tablet for those over 40. So. Could it be used as a herb? If so, in what concentration? Oh, I'm a slide behind. Willow. <laughs> so um, a, a slightly more uh, human or sort of uh, digestible example of this. Um, what about lemon and lime that you put in your cocktails or on salads or on fish and chips? You get a regular low dose of vitamin C preventing scurvy. Is that food or is it medicine? What about the traditional quinine tonic water that's used for gin and tonics? The reason that gin was so popular in British colonial India was that it was used to help prevent and treat mosquito-borne malaria. 
is your gin and tonic with your quinine gin, uh, sorry, quinine tonic and your slice of lime, food or medicine? The more that one sees nutritional and medical benefits of different herbs, different edible plants, whether that's reducing inflammation, regulating blood pressure, putting vitamin C and anti-malaria medication in your gin and tonic, the more they become interconnected. And I really came away from this project believing that a mode of thinking where the food that we put into our bodies directly informs our health, where adding up a lifetime of food decisions and how that affects the long-term health of our bodies really can't be a bad thing. The idea of food and medicine is interconnected is by far my biggest takeaway. So equally, how poisonous is too poisonous? It's a line which seems clear, but actually becomes quite complicated very quickly in the trenches of doing this research. So much of what I had to work with was anecdotal evidence and personal judgment comes into every single decision. Some reports of edibility come from completely untrustworthy or dubious texts. If you were charged with deciding if something was edible or not, when some sources say it's safe and some say it's poisonous or nauseating or has weird side effects, how would you decide? Current foods that are incorrectly stored or prepared can also have those properties. Potatoes stored in the light rather than the dark get steadily more toxic with exposure. Acute solanine poisoning from green potatoes or sprouted potatoes can in rare cases lead to death. A relatively recent example of solanine poisoning would be in 1979, a school in South London accidentally served green potatoes, poisoning 78 children. Drinking more than a couple cups of coffee can make you shaky and anxious and edgy. I once got five days of food poisoning from a cheese sandwich. Does coffee have undesirable side effects at remarkably low dose? Potato is deadly with incorrect storage. Does that affect how we see its edibility? Or would that affect how we see its edibility if we were unfamiliar with it? Much food preparation in the UK also prioritizes low prep foods. Cassava root, which is a staple food for an estimated 800 million people worldwide, has to be boiled for around 30 minutes to remove the cyanide and make it safe to eat, amongst other versions of preparations of it. So that's about 15% of the global population. One of their staple foods contains such high levels of cyanide, it has to be boiled for 30 minutes to be safe. How long or how many times would you be willing to, for example, boil a vegetable to reduce toxicity? If you read a paper that says that it's perfectly safe and edible after carefully boiling and disposing of the water three times, making sure that the, the fruit is washed or the vegetable is washed each time, would you consider that edible? Would you be willing to go through that labor? Equally, there are famously deadly poisonous mushrooms which are supposedly safe to eat and only actually mildly psychedelic after roasting. But I wouldn't want to be the one to encourage somebody to try a lethal mushroom and I probably wouldn't be keen to try it myself, even if the internet promises that if you put it in the oven for long enough, it really is safe and a good time. Arum, cuckoo pint, which I brought up the entry for earlier, contains a potentially lethal dose of calcium oxalate crystals, which burn the mouth and crystallize in the body, causing kidney and liver failure. Some sources say that with enough roasting, the root becomes safe to eat with no burning sensation. Equally, I found a woman on the internet who really tried that. She did it over and over and kept, you know, followed scientific method and put, put it in the oven for increasingly long periods of time and she never managed to roast it enough to stop the burning sensation in her mouth, which is the texture of the crystals kind of interacting with your body. Um, so that's sort of in the spirit of where you have, where you have uh, this crossover between food, medicine, and poison. There's a lot of things that are medicinal that are also poisonous, and those things have a, um, when you look back at traditional medicines, there's a lot more crossover and a lot more tolerance for that as well. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit just because I'm conscious of time. Um, so, Aram, uh, or no, already done Aram. How to define a native plant? What do you include? So, this is a tricky one. Uh, generally, the wider sort of botanical community uh, uses three categories true native, archaeophyte, and neophyte. So, true native, pre Neolithic, it's been in the country for around 5,000 years, or it arrived independently of man's activities and also man's domesticated animals' activities in that time. That's a pretty tricky thing to keep track of. How do you know the difference between something that blew in on the wind or something that came in on a shipping container? Following along from that, archaeophyte, 
Um, Archaeophytes, same roots as archaeology. It's generally the Roman colonial period. It's ancient history as far as we're concerned. So, um, so from approximately 40 AD, uh, these are mostly plants that were introduced by humans, introduced by the Romans. Uh, these are things like wheat. They are particularly tasty fruits. Uh, there's a lot of these that came from the wider Roman Empire um, and sort of ended up in the UK, and they are now ubiquitous with um, the sort of British landscape for having been here for a thousand or two thousand years. Neophyte is defined as uh, anything introduced after 1492, which is very, very specifically uh, Christopher Columbus's landing in North America. Um, and that's used as a cutting off point for this whole new era of, um, of exploration, of colonialism, of global trade, uh, the sort of Victorian habit of going out and collecting things and bringing them back. Um, and so there's this whole new kind of global period, and as far as plants are concerned, uh, that is Columbus's landing in North America is the cutoff for that. Um, a fun little complexity, just to throw into this, is that ancient woodland in the UK is woodland that has existed continuously since 1600 or before. So in theory, there are trees that are neophyte introductions in that window between 1492 and 1600 that we would classify as both modern introductions and ancient. Um, this, I really enjoy this topic. Uh, I'm not going to go much deeper on it, but um, I really want to recommend if anyone is interested, there is a fantastic paper written in 1992, uh, Introductions and Their Place in British Wildlife by Eversham and Arnold. It is 17 pages long, and it is just this topic in depth, and it is such a good time. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of modern problems, like, as mentioned, knowing whether something arrived on the wind or you know, by, uh, by shipping and import. But there's also, it gets into like reintroductions within the UK. If you transplant something from one area of the country to another area, is it technically native to that region? It's good. So that's my recommendation for, for more on this. So my original goal coming into this project was 500 years ago. So for example, 70 varieties of edible sedge seed, whether native or archaeophyte, feels appropriate to include in a way that neophyte sweet corn doesn't. Native and archaeophyte feel possible to group in a way that neophyte doesn't. I don't know how useful that is, because that's a feeling more than it is a judgment. It's difficult to know the exact year of introduction for most things, so there isn't necessarily a good or easy answer for this. Tracking movement of plants and animals, especially invasive or highly destructive species, like Japanese knotweed, which also makes an incredibly tender vegetable and is served in New York restaurants, <laughs> is important to help support healthy habitats and avoid species loss. The era definitions here are those generally accepted, but equally it feels like there has not yet been a full reconciliation with the implications of globalization for plant movement. You can kind of hold on to these definitions, but there's been so much movement and so much change in the 500 years since that, that cutoff that we use for neophyte. A lot of this stuff feels less relevant now um, as far as kind of like movement and borders and keeping track of things. Um, as an aside on this, I really just wanted to bring up that pheasants which are now synonymous with the UK's countryside are actually introductions. They're originally from the Caucasus and then from Asia. They were brought here for food and sport. There's some evidence of the Romans eating them in Britain, but the first written record of them doesn't occur until 1059, when they became hugely popular and even more so with the development of handheld guns in the 1500s. Pheasants are an archaeophyte. So, this is the fun bit. This is like, I've tried to pull out some cool plants from the research. Um, like I said, this is very, you're getting this in like a very raw form uh, where it's sort of just an Excel spreadsheet that I've conjured into a talk. But um, these are some highlights of the results. So um, starting with strawberry tree, uh, which I didn't know, it's, it's a, a native fruit in the UK. Uh, so I've included the distribution heat maps uh, alongside, that's from the BSBI database, um, the plant atlas. And so uh, strawberry tree comes from uh, Latin. Uh, it means I only eat one. <laughs> that can be read two ways. It's so good that I only eat one. Or rather, it's so unpleasant, I can only tolerate eating one. We got that name in 50 AD from Pliny the Elder, and uh, we don't know which he meant. So try strawberry tree at your own risk, and bearing in mind that you only eat one. 
Uh, so cleavers, which you'll probably be familiar with, uh, sort of favorite of school children to throw at each other. Uh, so the name gallium is derived from the Greek word for milk because the flowers of gallium were used to curdle milk in the process of cheese making. Um, I didn't know this. There's a number of plants that are particularly astringent that we use as part of the curdling process. This was completely new knowledge for me. Um, it's also really, really nice soaked in water overnight. It makes a kind of cucumbery flavored drink and it's meant to be very good for you. So cleavers aren't just good for bullying your friends. Um, I wanted to drop in native orchids. Uh, so we used to have a lot more native orchids in the UK than we do now. Um, so pre-coffee, uh, orchid bulbs were ground up into a sort of thick hot drink that was meant to be invigorating and an aphrodisiac. Uh, it was used for virility and passion as well as for weight gain as it was incredibly nutrient dense. Uh, most UK orchids were collected to near extinction. Um, in Turkey, orchids are still incredibly popular as a foodstuff. Uh, it has a similar issue of like problems with overcollection and problems with export. Um, it is still used as a flavoring, especially in ice cream. Uh, there's almost 120 species that are known to be used as food. And so harvesting an orchid and grounding up the bulb just destroys the plant. Um, and so the only way to, to conserve them is literally just to stop eating this food. And so that's something that's happened in the UK. Coffee overtook it as a far more popular alternative. Um, Salep has been banned from Turkey, uh, sorry, banned for exports from Turkey since 1974. Um, but I found a horrifying number of papers that were saying that um, all of the exports that they tested basically still had wild orchids in them. Um, please don't go and dig up orchids. Uh, I didn't put a map in because they are so incredibly rare. <laughs> um, but it was just a fun little thing. So I had to read a lot of Turkish uh, research papers for this one for dozens of species. Um, read canary grass. Uh, this is probably the most interesting thing that I came across because I had no idea that we had it. Um, it's our only, oh sorry, one of three native grasses all from the same family, uh, which naturally contains DMT. Um, it can be brewed in large enough quantities into a, an ad hoc, and I can never pronounce this correctly, um, ayahuasca. Don't correct me, it'll only be embarrassing. Um, large enough quantities can be refined uh, into, into a sort of ad hoc brew. Um, DMT can be found in common plants growing in a lot of the country. As you can see, the distribution for it is really, really strong. Uh, there's three species that contain this. Uh, there are quite a lot of narcotic plants that I came across that are UK natives, none of which I'd heard of, uh, including narcotic herbs that were used to increase the potency of beer. Um, I really wanted to go in depth on some of the more interesting uh, beer additives and like uh, beer ingredients. I think that could actually just be a talk in itself. There's so much. Um, like most of the drinks and teas category was actually just things used for alcohol. Uh, so that tells you a lot about us as a people. Um, slightly more wholesome is uh, red dead nettle. This is, I'm throwing this in as, uh, this is my favorite thing to forage. Uh, this is a really, really good starter for foraging if you haven't foraged before. Uh, it's a really delicious vegetable. Uh, it's great cooked, like sauteed with butter. You can chop it up in pesto. There's so many recipes online. Uh, the purple variety and the white variety are both delicious. You can eat all parts of it. You can't really go wrong. It looks like a stinging nettle, but it has flowers. If it has flowers, then, um, you're safe to eat it, it won't sting you. Uh, if it stings you, you've got it wrong. <laughs> so um, it's more nutritionally dense than spinach as well, so go out and find some dead nettle. Um, mallow is, uh, dwarf mallow is an archaeophyte, so not, not officially native, but um, it makes a great vegetable, but more interestingly, uh, soaking the roots brought to a boil uh, and simmered until the water becomes thick can be whisked the same as egg whites and used as an egg substitute. Um, including for meringue. It's good enough quality for meringue. Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit just because of time. But um, So Baltic rush. Um, sugars naturally come up through the root of Baltic rush and form as a crust on the top of the plant. Uh, these can be broken off and eaten as natural candy. It's naturally uh, crystallized sugar. Uh, and there's been a lot of documented uses of this from people all around the planet. Um, so what next for this, this body of work? Because right now it's just an Excel spreadsheet. Um, there's many other fun, th oh sorry, uh, going back to the previous bit. 
There's many other fun things that came from this research. So that includes like herbs that behave like chili and black pepper, all sorts of spices and additives, root vegetables, uh, plants used for traditional sour chutneys and pickles, syrup from native plant sources, and a lot of things for fermenting into alcohols of varying strengths. Um, but going forwards, I think refocusing on food from a wider variety of native plants, I think it really gives us the opportunity to reduce the impact of the plants that we eat. Um, we can better protect our food supplies from climate change, pollinator loss, disease. If you think about the global diet containing generally 50 plants, the fact that I now have this dumbass spreadsheet of nearly 1,400 things that can be found just in this country that we can use for foods feels like a really, really exciting thing. Um, so anyway, I've thrown some little ideas up here. I'm, I'm low on time. I wanted to end on the last point that I promised in the synopsis for this talk, which was, um, does lettuce exist? <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> Modern lettuce was developed from, and I, I apologize for my Latin, lactuca seriola, or prickly lettuce. Wild lettuce used to be spiny and toxic before humans intervened. Lettuce has never existed in the wild in the form that we know. We very specifically cultivated this spiny, poisonous plant to be something that we wanted to throw on our sandwiches. Your lettuce is a lie. <laughs> That's the original plant as found today.